welcome to Little Cozy Nook. Chapter 39 We rose early, and after our usual morning duties, we left our invalids for the whole day, taking with us for our dinner a goose and some potatoes, made ready the evening before. We harnessed the bull and the buffalo to the cart, and I sent Fritz and Jack to the wood of bamboos, with orders to load the cart with as many as it would contain, and especially to select some very thick ones for my colonnade. The rest I intended for props for my young trees, and this I proposed to be my first undertaking. Francis would have preferred beginning with the Franciade, or the garden, but he was finally won over by the thoughts of the delicious fruits which we might lose by our neglect, the peaches, plums, pears, and above all the cherries, of which he was very fond. He then consented to assist me in holding the trees whilst I replaced the roots, after which he went to cut the reeds to tie them. Suddenly I heard him cry, Papa, Papa, there is a large chest come for us. Come and take it. I ran to him, and saw it was the very chest we had seen floating, and which we had taken for the boat at a distance. The waves had left it in our bay, entangled in the reeds, which grew abundantly here. It was almost buried in the sand. We could not remove it alone, and, notwithstanding our curiosity, we were compelled to wait for the arrival of my sons. We returned to our work, and it was pretty well advanced when the tired and hungry party returned with their cartload of bamboos. We rested, and sat down to eat our goose. Guavas and sweet acorns, which had escaped the storm, and which my sons brought, completed our repast. Fritz had killed a large bird in the marsh, which I took at first for a young flamingo, but it was a young cassowary, the first I had seen in the island. This bird is remarkable for its extraordinary size, and for its plumage so short and fine that it seems rather to be hair than feathers. I should have liked to have had it alive to ornament our poultry yard, and it was so young we might have tamed it. But Fritz's unerring aim had killed it at once. I wished to let my wife see this rare bird, which, if standing on its webbed feet, would have been four feet high. I therefore forbade them to meddle with it. As we ate, we talked of the chest, and our curiosity being stronger than our hunger, we swallowed our repast hastily, and then ran down to the shore. We were obliged to plunge into the water up to the waist and then had some difficulty to extricate it from the weed and slime, and to push it on shore. No sooner had we placed it in safety than Fritz, with a strong hatchet, forced it open, and we all eagerly crowded to see the contents. Fritz hoped it would be powder and firearms. Jack, who was somewhat fond of dress, had had notions of elegance, declared in favour of clothes, and particularly of linen, finer and whiter than that which his mother wove. If Ernest had been there, books would have been his desire. For my own part, there was nothing I was more anxious for than European seeds, particularly corn. Francis had a lingering wish that the chest might contain some of those gingerbread cakes which his grandmamma used to treat him with in Europe, and which he had often regretted. But he kept this wish to himself fears his brothers should call him Little Glutton, and assured us that he should like a little pocket-knife with a small saw better than anything in the world, and he was the only one who had his wish. The chest was opened, and we saw that it was filled with a number of trifling things likely to tempt savage nations, and to become the means of exchange, principally glass and ironware, coloured beads, pins, needles, looking-glasses, children's toys, constructed as models, such as carts, and tools of every sort, amongst which we found some likely to be useful, such as hatchets, saws, planes, gimlets, etc., besides a collection of knives, of which Francis had the choice, and scissors, which were reserved for Mamma, her own being nearly worn out. I had, moreover, the pleasure of finding a quantity of nails of every size and kind, 
besides iron hooks, staples, etc., which I needed greatly. After we had examined the contents, and selected what we wanted immediately, we closed up the chest and conveyed it to our magazine at Tent House. We had spent so much time in our examination that we had some difficulty to finish propping our trees and to arrive at home before it was dark. We found my wife somewhat uneasy at our lengthened absence, but our appearance soon calmed her. Mother, said I, I have brought back all your chickens to crowd under your wing. And we have not come back empty-handed, said Jack. Look, Mama, here are a beautiful pair of scissors, a large paper of needles, another of pins, and a thimble. How rich you are now! And when you get well, you can make me a pretty waistcoat and a pair of trousers, for I am in great want of them. And I, Mama, said Francis, have brought you a mirror, that you may arrange your cap. You have often been sorry Papa did not remember to bring one from the ship. This was intended for the savages, and I will begin with you. I believe I rather resemble one now said my good Elizabeth, arranging the red and yellow silk handkerchief which she usually wore on her head. "'Only, Mama," said Jack, "'when you wear the comical pointed bonnet which Ernest made you—' "'What matters it,' said she, "'whether it be pointed or round? It will protect me from the sun, and it is the work of my Ernest, to whom I am much obliged.' Ernest, with great ingenuity and patience, had endeavoured to plate his mother a bonnet of the rice-straw. He had succeeded, but not knowing how to form the round crown, he was obliged to finish it in a point, to the great and incessant diversion of his brothers. Mother, said Ernest, in his usual grave and thoughtful tone, I should not like you to look like a savage, therefore as soon as I regain the use of my hand, my first work shall be to make you a bonnet which I will take care shall be formed with a round crown, as you will lend me one of your large needles, and I will take, to sew the crown on, the head of either Jack or Francis. "'What do you mean, my head?' said they both together. Oh, "'I don't mean to take it off your shoulders,' said he. "'It will only be necessary that one of you should kneel down before me, for a day, perhaps, while I use your head as a model.' and you need not cry out much if I should chance to push my needle in." This time the philosopher had the laugh on his side, and his tormentors were silenced. We now explained to my wife where we had found the presents we had brought her. My offerings to her were a light axe, which she could use to cut her firewood with, and an iron kettle, smaller and more convenient than the one she had. Fritz had retired, and now came in dragging with difficulty his huge cassowary. "'Here, Mama," said he, "'I brought you a little chicken for your dinner.' And the astonishment and laughter again commenced. The rest of the evening was spent in plucking the bird to prepare part of it for the next day. We then retired to rest, that we might begin our labour early next morning. Ernest chose to remain with his books and his mother, for whom he formed with the mattresses a sort of reclining chair, in which she was able to sit up in bed and sew. Thus she endured a confinement of six weeks, without complaint, and in that time got all her clothes put into good order. Francis had nearly betrayed our secret once, by asking his mamma to make him a mason's apron. "'A mason's apron?' said she. "'Are you going to build a house, child?' "'I, I meant to say... A gardener's apron," said he. His mamma was satisfied, and promised to comply with his request. In the meantime, my three sons and I laboured assiduously to get the garden into order again, and to raise the terraces, which we hoped might be a defence against future storms. Fritz had also proposed to me to construct a stone conduit, to bring the water to our kitchen garden from the river, to which we might carry it back after it had passed round our vegetable beds. This was a formidable task, but too useful an affair to be neglected, and, aided by the geometrical skill of Fritz and the ready hands of my two younger boys, the conduit was completed. 
I took an opportunity at the same time to dig a pond above the garden, into which the conduit poured the water. This was always warm with the sun, and, by means of a sluice, we were able to disperse it in little channels to water the garden. The pond would also be useful to preserve small fish and crabs for use. We next proceeded to our embankment. This was intended to protect the garden from any extraordinary overflow of the river, and from the water running from the rocks after heavy rains. We then laid out our garden on the same plan as before, except that I made the walks wider, and not so flat. I carried one directly to our house, which, in the autumn, I intended to plant with shrubs, that my wife might have a shady avenue to approach her garden, where I also planned an arbor, furnished with seats, as a resting place for her. The rocks were covered with numerous climbing plants, bearing every variety of elegant flower, and I had only to make my selection. All this work, with the enclosing the garden with palisades of bamboo, occupied us about a fortnight, in which time our invalids made great progress towards their recovery. After the whole was finished, Francis entreated me to begin his gallery. My boys approved of the plan, and Fritz declared that the house was certainly comfortable and commodious, but that it would be wonderfully improved by a colonnade, with a little pavilion at each end and a fountain in each pavilion. "'I never heard a word of these pavilions,' said I. "'No,' said Jack, "'they are our own invention. The colonnade will be called the Franciade, and we wish our little pavilions to be named the one Fritzia and the other Jackia, if you please.' I agreed to this reasonable request, and only begged to know how they would procure water for their fountains. Fritz undertook to bring the water, if I would only assist them in completing this little scheme, to give pleasure to their beloved mother. I was charmed to see the zeal and anxiety of my children to oblige their tender mother. Her illness seemed to have strengthened their attachment. They thought only how to console and amuse her. She sometimes told me she really blessed the accident, which had taught her how much she was valued by all around her. Chapter 40 The next day was Sunday, our happy Sabbath for repose and quiet conversation at home. After passing the day in our usual devotions and sober reading, my three elder boys requested my permission to walk towards our farm in the evening. On their return they informed me it would be necessary to give a few days' labour to our plantations of maize and potatoes. I therefore determined to look to them. Though I was out early next morning, I found Fritz and Jack had been gone some time, leaving only the ass in the stables, which I secured for my own little Francis. I perceived also that they had dismounted my cart and carried away the wheels, from which I concluded that they had met with some tree in their walk the preceding evening, suitable for the pipes for their fountains and that they had now returned to cut it down and convey it to Tent House. As I did not know where to meet with them, I proceeded with Francis on the ass to commence his favourite work. I drew my plan on the ground first. At the distance of twelve feet from the rock which formed the front of our house, I marked a straight line of fifty feet, which I divided into ten spaces of five feet each for my colonnade. The two ends were to be reserved for the two pavilions my sons wished to build. I was busy in my calculations, and Francis placing stakes in the places where I wished to dig, when the cart drove up with our two good labourers. They had, as I expected, found the evening before a species of pine well adapted for their pipes. They had cut down four, of fifteen or twenty feet in length, which they had brought on the wheels of the cart, drawn by the four animals. They had had some difficulty in transporting them to the place, and the greatest still remained, the boring the trunks, and then uniting them firmly. I had neither augers nor any tools fit for the purpose. I had certainly constructed a little fountain at Falcon's Nest, but the stream was near at hand, 
and was easily conveyed by our cane pipes to our tortoise-shell basin. Here the distance was considerable, the ground unequal, and to have the water pure and cool, underground pipes were necessary. I thought of large bamboos, but Fritz pointed out the knots, and the difficulty of joining the pieces, and begged me to leave it to him, as he had seen fountains made in Switzerland, and had no fears of success. In the meantime, all hands set to work at the arcade. We selected twelve bamboos of equal height and thickness, and fixed them securely in the earth at five feet from each other. These formed a pretty colonnade, and were work enough for one day. We took care to divert all inquiries at night by discussing the subjects which our invalids had been reading during the day. The little library of our captain was very choice. Besides the voyages and travels, which interested them greatly, there was a good collection of historians, and some of the best poets, for which Ernest had no little taste. However, he requested earnestly that he might be of our party next day, and Francis good-naturedly offered to stay with Mama, expecting, no doubt, Ernest's congratulations on the forward state of the Franciade. The next morning Ernest and I set out, his brothers having preceded us. Poor Ernest regretted, as we went, that he had no share in these happy schemes for his mother. I reminded him, however, of his dutiful care of her during her sickness, and all his endeavours to amuse her. "'And besides,' added I, "'did you not make her a straw bonnet?' "'Yes,' said he, "'and I now remember what a frightful shape it was. I will try to make a better, and will go to-morrow morning to choose my straw.' As we approached Tent House, we heard a most singular noise echoing at intervals amongst the rocks. We soon discovered the cause. In a hollow of the rocks I saw a very hot fire which Jack was blowing through a cane, whilst Fritz was turning amidst the embers a bar of iron. When it was red hot, they laid it on an anvil I had brought from the ship, and struck it alternately with hammers to bring it to a point. "'Well done, my young smiths,' said I. "'We ought to try all things, and keep what is good. Do you expect to succeed in making your auger?' I suppose that is what you want. Yes, father, said Fritz. We should succeed well enough if we only had a good pair of bellows. You see, we have already got a tolerable point. Now Fritz could not believe anything was impossible. He had killed a kangaroo the evening before, and skinned it. The flesh made us a dinner. Of the skin he determined to make a pair of bellows. He nailed it, with the hair out, not having time to tan it, to two flat pieces of wood, with holes in them. To this he added a reed for the pipe. He then fixed it by means of a long cord and a post to the side of his fire, and Jack, with his hand or foot, blew the fire, so that the iron was speedily red-hot and quite malleable. I then showed them how to twist the iron into a screw, rather clumsy but which would answer the purpose tolerably well. At one end they formed a ring, in which we placed a piece of wood transversely, to enable them to turn the screw. We then made a trial of it. We placed a tree on two props, and Fritz and I managed the auger so well that we had our tree pierced through in a very little time, working first at one end and then at the other. Jack, in the meantime, collected the shavings we made, which he deposited in the kitchen for his mother's use, to kindle the fire. Ernest, meanwhile, was walking about, making observations, and giving his advice to his brothers on the architecture of their pavilions, till, seeing that they were going to bore another tree, he retired into the garden to see the embankment. He returned delighted with the improvements, and much disposed to take some employment. He wanted to assist in boring the tree, but we could not all work at it. I undertook this labour myself, and sent him to blow the bellows, while his brothers laboured at the forge, the work not being too hard for his lame hand. My young smiths were engaged in flattening the iron to make joints to unite their pipes. They succeeded very well, 
and then began to dig the ground to lay them. Ernest, knowing something of geometry and land surveying, was able to give them some useful hints, which enabled them to complete their work successfully. Leaving them to do this, I employed myself in covering in my long colonnade. After I had placed on my columns a plank cut in arches which united them, and was firmly nailed to them, I extended from it bamboos placed sloping against the rock, and secured to it by cramps of iron the work of my young smiths. When my bamboo roof was solidly fixed, the canes as close as possible, I filled the interstices with a clay I found near the river, and poured gum over it. I had thus an impervious and brilliant roof, which appeared to be varnished, and striped green and brown. I then raised the floor a foot, in order that there might be no damp, and paved it with the square stones I had preserved when we cut the rock. It must be understood that all this was the work of many days. I was assisted by Jack and Fritz, and by Ernest and Francis alternately, one always remaining with his mother, who was still unable to walk. Ernest employed his time, when at home, in making the straw bonnet, without either borrowing his brother's head for a model, or letting any of them know what he was doing. Nevertheless, he assisted his brothers with their pavilions by his really valuable knowledge. They formed them very elegantly, something like a Chinese pagoda. They were exactly square, supported on four columns, and rather higher than the gallery. The roofs terminated in a point, and resembled a large parasol. The fountains were in the middle, the basins, breast-high, were formed of the shells of two turtles from our reservoir, which were mercilessly sacrificed for the purpose, and furnished our table abundantly for some days. They succeeded the cassowary, which had supplied us very seasonably. Its flesh tasted like beef, and made excellent soup. But to return to the fountains. Ernest suggested the idea of ornamenting the end of the perpendicular pipe, which brought the water to the basin, with shells, every sort might be collected on the shore, of the most brilliant colours, and curious and varied shapes. He was passionately devoted to natural history, and had made a collection of these, endeavouring to classify them from the descriptions he met with in the books of voyages and travels. Some of these, of the most dazzling beauty, were placed round the pipe, which had been plastered with clay. From thence the water was received into a volute, shaped like an antique urn, and again was poured gracefully into the large turtle-shell. A small channel conveyed it then out of the pavilions. The whole was completed in less time than I could have imagined, and greatly surpassed my expectations, conferring an inestimable advantage on her dwelling, by securing us from the heat. All honour was rendered to Master Francis the inventor, and the Franciade was written in large letters on the middle arch. Fritzia and Jackia were written in the same way over the pavilions. Ernest alone was not named, and he seemed somewhat affected by it. He had acquired a great taste for rambling and botanizing, and had communicated it also to Fritz. And now that our labours were ended at Tent House, they left us to nurse our invalid, and made long excursions together, which lasted sometimes whole days. As they generally returned with some game, or some new fruit, we pardoned their absence, and they were always welcome. Sometimes they brought a kangaroo, sometimes an agouti, the flesh of which resembles that of a rabbit, but is richer. Sometimes they brought wild ducks, pigeons, and even partridges. These were contributed by Fritz, who never went out without his gun and his dogs. Ernest brought us natural curiosities, which amused us much. Stones, crystals, petrifactions, insects, butterflies of rare beauty, and flowers, whose colours and fragrance no one in Europe can form an idea of. Sometimes he brought fruit which we always administered first to our monkey as taster, some of them proved very delicious. 
Two of his discoveries especially were most valuable acquisitions. The Guajaraba, on the large leaf of which one may write with a pointed instrument, and the fruit of which, a sort of grape, is very good to eat. Also the date palm, every part of which is so useful that we were truly thankful to heaven, and our dear boys for the discovery. Whilst young, the trunk contains a sort of marrow, very delicious. The date palm is crowned by a head, formed of from forty to eighty leafy branches, which spread round the top. The dates are particularly good about half-dried, and my wife immediately began to preserve them. My sons could only bring the fruit now, but we proposed to transplant some of the trees themselves near our abode. We did not discourage our sons in these profitable expeditions, but they had another aim, which I was yet ignorant of. In the meantime, I usually walked with one of my younger sons towards Tent House, to attend to our garden, and to see if our works continued in good condition to receive Mama, who daily improved. But I insisted on her being completely restored before she was introduced to them. Our dwelling looked beautiful amongst the picturesque rocks, surrounded by trees of every sort, and facing the smooth and lovely Bay of Safety. The garden was not so forward as I could have wished, but we were obliged to be patient, and hope for the best. CHAPTER Forty One. One day, having gone over with my younger sons to weed the garden, and survey our possessions, I perceived that the roof of the gallery wanted a little repair, and called Jack to raise for me the rope-ladder which I had brought from Falcon's Nest, and which had been very useful while we were constructing the roof. But we sought for it everywhere. It could not be found, and as we were quite free from robbers in our island, I could only accuse my elder sons, who had doubtless carried it off to ascend some tall coconut tree. Obliged to be content, we walked into the garden by the foot of the rocks. Since our arrival, I had been somewhat uneasy at hearing a dull, continued noise, which appeared to proceed from this side. The forge we had passed, now extinguished, and our workmen were absent. Passing along close to the rocks, the noise became more distinct, and I was truly alarmed. Could it be an earthquake? Or perhaps it announced some volcanic explosion? I stopped before that part of the rock where the noise was loudest. The surface was firm and level, but from time to time blows and falling stones seemed to strike our ears. I was uncertain what to do. Curiosity prompted me to stay, but a sort of terror urged me to remove my child and myself. However, Jack, always daring, was unwilling to go till he had discovered the cause of the phenomenon. "'If Francis were here,' said he, "'he would fancy it was the wicked gnomes working underground, and he would be in a fine fright. For my part, I believe it is only people come to collect the salt in the rock.' "'People,' said I, "'you don't know what you're saying, Jack. I could excuse Francis and his gnomes. It would be at least a poetic fancy, but yours is quite absurd.' Where are the people to come from? Well, what else can it be? said he. Hark! You may hear them strike the rock. Be certain, however, said I, there are no people. At that moment I distinctly heard human voices, speaking, laughing, and apparently clapping their hands. I could not distinguish any words. I was struck with a mortal terror. But Jack, whom nothing could alarm, clapped his hands also with joy that he had guessed right. "'What did I say, papa? Was I not right? Are there not people within the rock? Friends, I hope.' He was approaching the rock, when it appeared to me to be shaking. A stone soon fell down, then another. I seized hold of Jack to drag him away, lest he should be crushed by the fragments of rock. At that moment another stone fell, and we saw two heads appear through the opening, the heads of Fritz and Ernest. Judge of our surprise and joy. Jack was soon through the opening, and assisting his brothers to enlarge it. As soon as I could enter, I stepped in, and found myself in a real grotto of a round form with a vaulted roof, divided by a narrow crevice which admitted the light and air. It was, however, 
better lighted by two large gourd lamps. I saw my long ladder of ropes suspended from the opening at the top, and thus comprehended how my sons had penetrated into this recess, which it was impossible to suspect the existence of from the outside. But how had they discovered it? And what were they making of it? These were my two questions. Ernest replied at once to the last. I wished, said he, to make a resting place for my mother when she came to her garden. My brothers have each built some place for her and called it by their name. I had a desire that some place in our island might be dedicated to Ernest, and I now present to you the Grotto Ernestine. And after all, said Jack, it will make a pretty dwelling for the first of us that marries. Silence, little giddy pate, said I. Where do you expect to find a wife in this island? Do you think you shall discover one among the rocks, as your brothers have discovered the grotto? But tell me, Fritz, what directed you here? Our good star, father, said he. Ernest and I were walking round these rocks, and talking of his wish for a resting place for my mother on her way to the garden. He projected a tent, but the path was too narrow to admit it, and the rock heated by the sun was like a stove. We were considering what we should do when I saw on the summit of the rock a very beautiful little unknown quadruped. From its form I should have taken it as a young chamois, if I had been in Switzerland, but Ernest reminded me that the chamois was peculiar to cold countries, and he thought it was a gazelle or antelope, probably the gazelle of Guinea or Java, called by naturalists the Chevrotain. You may suppose I tried to climb the rock on which this little animal remained standing, with one foot raised, and its pretty head turning first to one side and then to the other, but it was useless to attempt it here, where the rock was smooth and perpendicular. Besides, I should have put the gazelle to flight, as it is a timid and wild animal. I then remembered that there was a place near Tent House, where a considerable break occurred in the chain of rocks and we found that, with a little difficulty, the rock might be scaled by ascending this ravine. Ernest laughed at me, and asked me if I expected the antelope would wait patiently till I got to it. No matter, I determined to try, and I told him to remain, but he soon determined to accompany me, for he fancied that in the fissure of a rock he saw a flower of a beautiful rose color, which was unknown to him. My learned botanist thought it might be an erica, or heath and wished to ascertain the fact. One helping the other, we soon got through all difficulties, and arrived at the summit, and here we were amply repaid by the beautiful prospect on every side. We will talk of that afterwards, father. I have formed some idea of the country which these rocks separate us from. But to return to our grotto. I went along, first looking for my pretty gazelle, which I saw licking a piece of rock, where, doubtless, she found some salt. I was hardly a hundred yards from her, my gun ready, when it was suddenly stopped by a crevice which I could not cross, though the opening was not very wide. The pretty quadruped was on a rock opposite to me, but of what use would it have been to shoot it when I could not secure it? I was obliged to defer it until a better opportunity offered, and turned to examine the opening, which appeared deep. Still I could see that the bottom of the cavity was white, like that of our former grotto. I called Ernest, who was behind me with his plants and stones, to impart to him an idea that suddenly struck me. It was to make this the retreat for my mother. I told him that I believed the floor of the cave was nearly on a level with the path that led to the garden, and we had only to make an opening in the form of a natural grotto, and it would be exactly what he wished. Ernest was much pleased with the idea, and said he could easily ascertain the level by means of a weight attached to a string. But though he was startled at the difficulty of descending to our labor every day, and returning in the evening, he would not agree to my wish of beginning at the outside of the rock, as we had done in our former grotto. He had several reasons for wishing to work from within. In the first place, said he, it will be so much cooler this summer weather we should soon unable to go on laboring before the burning rock. Then our path is so narrow that we should not know how to dispose of the rubbish. In the interior it will serve us to make a bench round the grotto. 
Besides, I should have such pleasure in completing it secretly and unsuspected, without any assistance or advice except yours, my dear Fritz, which I accept with all my heart. So pray find some means of descending and ascending readily. I immediately recollected your rope ladder, father. It was forty feet long, and we could easily fasten it to the point of the rock. Ernest was delighted and sanguine. We returned with all speed. We took first a roll of cord and some candles, then the rope ladder, which we rolled up as well as we could, but had great difficulty in conveying it up to the rock. Once or twice, when the ascent was very difficult, we were obliged to fasten a cord to it and draw it up after us. But determination, courage, and perseverance overcame all obstacles. We arrived at the opening, and, on sounding it, we were glad to find our ladder would be long enough to reach the bottom. We then measured the outside of the rock, and ascertained that the floor of the grotto was near the same level as the ground outside. We remembered your lessons, father, and made some experiments to discover if it contained mephitic air. We first lighted some candles, which were not extinguished. We then kindled a large heap of sticks and dried grass, which burned well the smoke passing through the opening like a chimney. Having no uneasiness about this, we deferred our commencement till the next day. Then we lighted the forge, and pointed some iron bars we found in the magazine. These were to be our tools to break open the rock. We secured also your chisel, as well as some hammers, and all our tools were thrown down below. We then arranged two gourds to serve us for lamps, and when all was ready, and our ladder firmly fixed, we descended ourselves, and we have nothing more to tell you, except that we were very glad when we heard your voices outside, at the very time when our work was drawing to an end. We were sure, when we distinguished your voices so clearly, that we must be near the external air. We redoubled our efforts, and here we are. Now tell us, father, are you pleased with our idea, and will you forgive us for making a mystery of it? I assured them of my forgiveness, and my cordial approbation of their manly and useful enterprise, and made Ernest happy by declaring that it should always be called the Grotto Ernestine. "'Thanks to you all, my dear children,' said I. "'Your dear mamma will now prefer Tent House to Falcon's Nest, and will have no occasion to risk breaking a limb and descending a winding staircase. I will assist you to enlarge the opening, and as we will leave it, all the simplicity of a natural grotto, it will soon be ready. We all set to work. Jack carried away the loosened stones and rubbish, and formed benches on each side of the grotto. With what had fallen outside, he also made two seats in the front of the rock, and before evening all was complete. Fritz ascended to unfasten the ladder, and to convey it by an easier road to Tent House. He then rejoined us, and we returned to our castle in the air, which was henceforward only to be looked on as a pleasure-house. We resolved, however, to establish here, as we had done at our farm, a colony of our cattle, which increased daily. We had now a number of young cows, and which were most useful for our support. We wished, however, for a female buffalo, as the milk of that animal makes excellent cheese. Conversing on our future plans, we soon reached home, and found all well. CHAPTER 42 In a few days we completed the Grotto Ernestine. It contained some stalactites, but not so many as our former grotto. We found, however, a beautiful block of salt, all resembled white marble, of which Ernest formed a sort of altar, supported by four pillars, on which he placed a pretty vase of citron wood which he had turned himself, and in which he arranged some of the beautiful erica which had been the cause of his discovering the grotto. It was one of those occasions when his feelings overcame his natural indolence, when he became for a time the most active of the four, and brought forward all his resources, which were many. This indolence was merely physical, when not excited by any sudden circumstance, or by some fancy which soon assumed the character of a passion. He loved ease, and to enjoy life tranquilly and study. He improved his mind continually, as well by his excellent memory, 
as by natural talent and application. He reflected, made experiments, and was always successful. He had at last succeeded in making his mother a very pretty bonnet. He had also composed some verses which were intended to celebrate her visit to Tent House, and this joyful day being at last fixed, the boys all went over, the evening before, to make their preparations. The flowers that the storm had spared were gathered to ornament the fountains, the altar, and the table, on which was placed an excellent cold dinner, entirely prepared by themselves. Fritz supplied and roasted the game, a fine bustard, the flesh of which resembles a turkey, and a brace of partridges. Ernest brought pines, melons, and figs. Jack should have supplied the fish, but was able only to procure oysters, crabs, and turtles' eggs. Francis had the charge of the dessert, which consisted of a dish of strawberries, honeycomb, and the cream of the coconut. I had contributed a bottle of canary wine, that we might drink Mama's health. All was arranged on a table in the middle of the Franciade, and my sons returned to accompany the expedition next day. The morning was beautiful, and the sun shone brightly on our emigration. My wife was anxious to set out, expecting that she should have to return to her dwelling. Though her leg and foot were better, she still walked feebly, and she begged us to harness the cow and ass to the cart, and to lead them as gently as possible. "'I will only go a little way the first day,' said she, "'for I am not strong enough to visit Tent House yet.' We felt quite convinced that she would change her opinion when once in her litter. I wished to carry her down the staircase, but she declined, and descended very well with the help of my arm. When the door was opened, and she found herself once more in the open air, surrounded by her children, she thanked God with tears of gratitude for her recovery, and all His mercies to us. Then the pretty Osher carriage arrived. They had harnessed the cow and young bull to it. Francis, answering for the docility of Valiant, provided he guided him himself. Accordingly he was mounted before, his cane in his hand, and his bow and quiver on his back, very proud to be Mama's charioteer. My other three boys, mounted on their animals, were ready before, to form the advance guard, while I proposed to follow, and watch over the whole. My wife was moved even to tears, and could not cease admiring her new carriage, which Fritz and Jack presented to her as their own work. Francis, however, boasted that he had carted the cotton for the soft cushion on which she was to sit, and I that I had made it. I then lifted her in, and as soon as she was seated Ernest came to put her new bonnet on her head, which greatly delighted her. It was of fine straw, and so thick and firm that it might even defend her from the rain. But what pleased her most was that it was the shape worn by the Swiss peasants in the canton of Vaud, where my dear wife had resided some time in her youth. She thanked all her dear children, and felt so easy and comfortable in her new conveyance, that we arrived at Family Bridge without her feeling the least fatigue. Here we stopped. "'Would you like to cross here, my dear?' said I. "'And as we are very near, look in at your convenient tent-house, where you will have no staircase to ascend, and we should like to know, too, if you approve of our management of your garden.' "'As you please,' said she. "'In fact, I am so comfortable in my carriage, that if it were necessary I could make the tour of the island. I should like to see my house again but it will be so very hot at this season that we must not stay long. "'But you must dine there, my dear mother,' said Fritz. "'It is too late to return to dinner at Falcon's Nest. Consider, too, the fatigue it would occasion you.' "'I would be very glad indeed, my dear,' said she. "'But what are we to dine on? We have prepared no provision, and I fear we shall all be hungry.' "'Oh, what matter?' said Jack. "'Provided you dine with us.' You must take your chance. I will go and get some oysters, that we may not die of hunger." And off he galloped on his buffalo. Fritz followed him, on some pretense, on Lightfoot. Mama wished that she had brought a vessel to carry some water from the river, for she knew we could get none at Tent House. Francis reminded her we could milk the cow, 
and she was satisfied, and enjoyed her journey much. At last we arrived before the colonnade. My wife was dumb with wonder for some moments. "'Where am I, and what do I see?' said she, when she could speak. "'You see the Franciade, mamma," said her little boy. "'This beautiful colonnade was my invention, to protect you from the heat. Stay, read what is written above. Francis to his dear mother. May this colonnade, which is called the Franciade, be to her a temple of happiness. Now, mamma, lean on me, and come and see my brother's gifts, much better than mine." And he led her to Jack's pavilion, who was standing by the fountain. He held a shell in his hand, which he filled with water, and drank, saying, "'To the health of the Queen of the Island! May she have no more accidents, and live as long as her children! Long live Queen Elizabeth, and may she come every day to Jackia, to drink her son Jack's health. I supported my wife, and was almost as much affected as herself. She wept and trembled with joy and surprise. Jack and Ernest then joined their hands, and carried her to the other pavilion, where Fritz was waiting to receive her, and the same scene of tenderness ensued. "'Accept this pavilion, dear mother,' said he, and may Fritzia ever make you think on Fritz." The delighted mother embraced them all, and observing Ernest's name was not commemorated by any trophy, thanked him again for her beautiful bonnet. She then drank some of the delicious water of the fountain, and returned to seat herself at the repast, which was another surprise for her. We all made an excellent dinner, and at the dessert I handed my canary wine round in shells, and then Ernest rose and sung us very prettily to a familiar air some little verses he had composed. On this festive happy day let us pour our grateful lay, since heaven has hushed our mother's pain and given her to her sons again. Then from this quiet, lovely home never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. When o'er our mother's couch we bent, fervent prayers to heaven we sent, and God has spared that mother dear to bless her happy children here. Then from this quiet, lovely home, never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. We all joined in the chorus, and none of us thought of the ship, of Europe, or of anything that was passing in the world. The island was our universe, and Tent House was a palace we would not have exchanged for any the world contained. This was one of those happy days that God grants us sometimes on earth, to give us an idea of the bliss of heaven, and most fervently did we thank Him, at the end of our repast, for all His mercies and blessings to us. After dinner I told my wife she must not think of returning to Falcon's Nest, with all its risk of storms and the winding staircase and she could not better recompense her sons for their labours than by living among them. She was of the same opinion, and was very glad to be so near her kitchen and her stores, and to be able to walk alone with the assistance of a stick in the colonnade, which she could do already. But she made me promise to leave Falcon's Nest as it was. It would be a pretty place to walk to, and besides, this castle in the air was her own invention. We agreed that this very evening she should take possession of her own pretty room, with the good felt carpet, on which she could walk without fear, and that on the next day I should go with my elder sons and the animals to bring the cart, such utensils as we needed, and above all, the poultry. Our dogs always followed their masters, as well as the monkey and jackal, and they were so domesticated we had no trouble with them. I then prevailed on my wife to go into her room and rest for an hour, after which we were to visit the garden. She complied, and after her repose found her four sons ready to carry her in her litter as in a sedan chair. They took care to bring her straight to the grotto, where I was waiting for her. This was a new surprise for the good mother. She could not sufficiently express her astonishment and delight when Jack and Francis taking their flagellets, 
accompanied their brothers, who sung the following verse, which Ernest had added to his former attempt. Dear mother, let this gift be mine, except the grotto Ernestine. May all your hours be doubly blessed within this tranquil place of rest. Then from this quiet, lovely home, never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. What cause had we to rejoice in our children? We could not but shed tears to witness their affection and perfect happiness. Below the vase of flowers, on the block of salt, Ernest had written, Ernest, assisted by his brother Fritz, has prepared this grotto as a retreat for his beloved mother when she visits her garden. Ernest then conducted his mother to one of the benches, which he had covered with soft moss, as a seat for her, and there she rested at her ease to hear the history of the discovery of the grotto. It was now my turn to offer my present, the garden, the embankment, the pond, and the arbor. She walked, supported by my arm, to view her little empire, and her delight was extreme. The pond, which enabled her to water her vegetables, particularly pleased her, as well as her shady arbor, under which she found all her gardening tools, ornamented with flowers, and augmented by two light watering-pans, constructed by Jack and Francis from two gourds. They had canes for spouts, with the gourd bottles at the end, pierced with holes, through which the water came in the manner of a watering-pan. The embankment was also a great surprise. She proposed to place plants of pines and melons on it, and I agreed to it. Truly did she rejoice at the appearance of the vegetables, which promised us some excellent European provision, a great comfort to her. After expressing her grateful feelings, she returned to the grotto, and seating herself in her sedan chair, returned to Tent House, to enjoy the repose she needed after such a day of excitement. We did not, however, lie down before we had together thanked God for the manifold blessings He had given us, and for the pleasure of that day. "'If I had been in Europe,' said my dear wife, "'on the festival of my recovery, I should have received a nosegay, a ribbon, or some trinket. Here I have been presented a carriage, a colonnade, pavilions, ornamental fountains, a large grotto, a garden, a pond, an arbor, and a straw bonnet. Chapter 43 The next and following days were spent in removing our furniture and property, particularly our poultry, which had multiplied greatly. We also constructed a poultry yard, at a sufficient distance from our house to save our sleep from disturbance, and still so near that we could easily tend them. We made it as a continuation of the colonnade, and on the same plan, but enclosed in the front by a sort of wire trellis work, which Fritz and Jack made wonderfully well. Fritz, who had a turn for architecture and mechanics, gave me some good hints, especially one which we put into execution. This was to carry the water from the basin of the fountain through the poultry yard, which enabled us also to have a little pond for our ducks. The pigeons had their abode above the hen-roosts, in some pretty baskets, which Ernest and Francis made, similar to those made by the savages of the Friendly Isles, of which they had seen engravings in Cook's voyages. When all was finished, my wife was delighted to think that, even in the rainy season, she could attend to her feathered family and collect their eggs. "'What a difference!' said she, admiring the elegance of our buildings. What a difference between this tent-house and the original dwelling that suggested the name to us, and which was our only shelter four years ago! What a surprising progress luxury has made with us in that time! Do you remember, my dear, the barrel which served us for a table, and the oyster-shells for spoons, and the tent where we slept, crowded together on dried leaves, and without undressing, and the river half a mile off? where we were obliged to go to drink if we were thirsty. Compared to what we were then, we are now great lords." "'Kings, you mean, Mama," said Jack, "'for all this island is ours, and it is quite like a kingdom.' 
and how many millions of subjects does Prince Jack reckon in the kingdom of his august father?" said I. Prince Jack declared he had not yet counted the parrots, kangaroos, agoutis, and monkeys. The laughter of his brothers stopped him. I then agreed with my wife that our luxuries had increased, but I explained to her that this was the result of our industry. All civilized nations have commenced as we did. Necessity has developed the intellect which God has given to man alone, and by degrees the arts have progressed, and knowledge has extended more, perhaps, than is conducive to happiness. What appeared luxury to us now was still simplicity compared with the luxury of towns, or even villages among civilized nations. My wife declared she had everything she wished for, and should not know what more to ask for as we now had only to rest and enjoy our happiness. I declared against spending our time in rest and indolence as the sure means of ending our pleasure, and I well knew my dear wife was, like myself, an enemy to idleness, but she dreaded any more laborious undertakings. But, Mama, said Fritz, you must let me make a mill under the cascade. It will be so useful when our corn grows, and even now for the maize. I also think of making an oven in the kitchen, which will be very useful for you to bake your bread in." "'These would indeed be useful labours,' said the good mother, smiling. "'But can you accomplish them?' "'I hope so,' said Fritz, with the help of God and that of my dear brothers." Ernest promised his best aid, in return for his brother's kind services in forming his grotto, only requesting occasional leisure for his natural history collections. His mother did not see the utility of these collections, but, willing to indulge her kind and attentive earnest, she offered, till she could walk well, to assist him in arranging and labelling his plants, which were yet in disorder, and he gratefully consented. In procuring her some paper for the purpose, of which I had brought a large quantity from the vessel, I brought out an unopened packet amongst which was a piece of some fabric, neither paper nor stuff, apparently. We examined it together, and at length remembered it was a piece of stuff made at Odahaita, which our captain had bought of a native at an island where we had touched on our voyage. Fritz appearing much interested in examining this cloth, Ernest said gravely, I can teach you how to make it and immediately bringing Cook's Voyages, where a detailed description is given, he proceeded to read it. Fritz was disappointed to find it could only be made of the bark of three trees. Of these our island produced only one. These trees were the mulberry tree, the breadfruit, and the wild fig. We had the last in abundance, but of the two former we had not yet discovered a single plant. Fritz was not, however, discouraged. They ought to be here, said he, since they are found in all the South Sea Islands. Perhaps we may find them on the other side of the rocks, where I saw some superb unknown trees from the height where we discovered the grotto. And who knows, but I may find my pretty gazelle there again. The rogue can leap better than I can over those rocks. I had a great wish to descend them, but found it impossible. Some are very high and perpendicular. Others have overhanging summits. I might, however, get round as you did by the pass, between the torrent and the rocks at Great Bay." Jack offered to be his guide, even with his eyes shut, into that rich country where he conquered and captured his buffalo, and Ernest begged to be of the party. As this was an expedition I had long projected, I agreed to accompany them next day their mother being content to have Francis left with her as a protector. I cautioned Fritz not to fire off his gun when we approached the buffaloes, as any show of hostility might render them furious. Otherwise the animals, unaccustomed to man, had no fear of him, and will not harm him. In general, added I, I cannot sufficiently recommend to you to be careful of your powder. We have not more than will last us a year and there may be a necessity to have recourse to it for our defence. "'I have a plan for making it,' said Fritz, who never saw a difficulty in anything. "'I know it is composed of charcoal, saltpetre, and sulphur, and we ought to find all these materials in the island. 
it is only necessary to combine them and to form it into little round grains. This is my only difficulty, but I will consider it over, and I have my mill to think on first. I have a confused recollection of a powder manufacture yet burned. There was some machinery which went by water. This machinery moved some hammers, which pounded and mixed the ingredients. Was this not the case, father? Something like it, said I. But we have many things to do before making powder. First we must go to sleep. We must set out before daybreak, if we intend to return to-morrow evening. We did indeed rise before the sun, which would not rise for us. The sky was very cloudy, and shortly we had an abundant and incessant rain, which obliged us to defer our journey, and put us all in bad humour. But my wife, who was not sorry to keep us with her, and who declared this gracious rain would water her garden, and bring it forward. Fritz was the first who consoled himself. He thought on nothing but building mills and manufacturing gunpowder. He begged me to draw him a mill. This was very easy, so far as regards the exterior, that is, the wheel and the waterfall that sets it in motion, but the interior, the disposition of the wheels, the stones to bruise the grain, the sieve or bolter to separate the flour from the bran. All this complicated machinery was difficult to explain, but he comprehended all, adding his usual expression, I will try, and I will succeed. Not to lose any time, and to profit by this rainy day, he began by making sieves of different materials, which he fastened to a circle of pliant wood, and tried by passing through them the flower of the cassava. He made some with sailcloth, others with the hair of the onagra, which is very long and strong, and some of the fibres of bark. His mother admired his work, which he continued to improve more and more. She assured him the sieve would be sufficient for her. It was useless to have the trouble of building a mill. "'But how shall we bruise the grain, Mama? said he. "'It would be tedious and hard work.' "'And you think there will be no hard work in building your mill?' said Jack. I'm curious to see how you will contrive to form that huge stone, which is called the millstone." "'You shall see,' said Fritz. "'Only find me the stone, and it shall soon be done. Do you think, father, that of our rock would be suitable?' I told him I thought it would be hard enough, but it would be difficult to cut from the rock a piece large enough for the purpose. He made his usual reply, "'I will try.' Ernest and Jack will assist me, and perhaps you, Papa." I declared my willingness, but named him the Master Mason. We must only be his workmen. Francis was impatient to see the mill in operation. "'Oh,' said Jack, "'you shall soon have that pleasure. It is a mere trifle. We only want stone, wood, tools, and science.' At the word science, Ernest, who was reading in a corner without listening to us, raised his head suddenly, saying, well, "'What science are you in need of?' "'Of one you know nothing of, Mr. Philosopher,' said Jack. "'Come, tell us. Do you know how to build a mill?' "'A mill?' answered Ernest. "'Of what description? There are many sorts. I was just looking in my dictionary for it. There are corn mills and powder mills, oil mills, wind mills, water mills, hand mills, and saw mills. Which do you want?' Fritz would have liked them all. "'You remind me,' said I, "'that we brought from the vessel a hand-mill and a saw-mill, taken to pieces, to be sure, but numbered and labelled, so that they might easily be united. They should be in the magazine, where you found the anvil and iron bars. I had forgotten them.' "'Let's go and examine them,' said Fritz, lighting his lantern. "'I shall get some ideas from them.' "'Rather,' said his mother, they will spare you the trouble of thinking and labouring. I sent them all four to seek these treasures, which, heaped in an obscure corner of the storeroom, had escaped my recollection. When we were alone, I seriously besought my wife not to oppose any occupations our children might plan, however they might seem beyond their power, the great point being to keep them continually occupied so that no evil or dangerous fancies might fill their minds. Let them, I said, 
cut stone, fell trees, or dig fountains, and bless God that their thoughts are so innocently directed. She understood me, and promised not to discourage them, only fearing the excessive fatigue of these undertakings. Chapter 44 Fritz struck his forehead, and seizing Ernest by the arm, Brother, said he, what fools we have been! Ernest inquired what folly they had been guilty of. Why did we not, said Fritz, when we were working within our grotto, attempt to make the opening on the other side? We should not have had much difficulty, I am persuaded, and if our tools had not been sufficient, a little powder would have opened us a door on the other side. Only consider, father, the convenience of bringing the cart loaded with the trees we wanted through our grotto, and to be able to go a-hunting without having I don't know how many miles to go." "'Well, we can still do that,' said Ernest, in his usual calm, grave manner. "'If we do not find another passage, we will make one through the grotto Ernestine, with Mamma's permission, as it is her property." This idea of my son appeared good. It was quite certain from our experience at Tent House and in the grotto that the cavity in the rocks was of very great extent, and it did not appear difficult to pierce through to the other side. But some other chain of rocks, some gigantic tree, some hill at the end of our tunnel, might render all our labour useless. I proposed that we should defer our work till we had examined the nature of the ground on the other side. My sons agreed, and we proceeded with renewed courage, when we were suddenly checked by the sight of the sea beating against a perpendicular rock of terrific height, which terminated our island on this side, and did not give us a chance of going on. I saw the rock did not extend far, but how to get round it I could not devise. I did not conceive we could get the pinnace round, as the coast seemed surrounded by reefs. Masses of rock stood up in the sea, and the breakers showed us that more were hidden. After much consideration and many plans, Ernest proposed that we should swim out to the uncovered rocks, and endeavour to pass around. Fritz objected, on account of his arms and ammunition, but Ernest suggested that the powder should be secured in the pockets of his clothes, which he might carry on his head holding his gun above the water. With some difficulty we arranged our encumbrances, and succeeded in reaching the range of outer rocks, without swimming, as the water was not above our shoulders. We rested here a while, and putting on some of our clothes, we commenced our rock over sharp stones, which wounded our feet. In many places, where the rocks lay low, we were up to the waist in the water. Ernest, the proposer of the plan, encouraged us and led the way for some time, but at last he fell behind, and remained so long, that I became alarmed, and, calling aloud, for I had lost sight of him, he answered me, and at last I discovered him stretched on the rock, endeavouring to separate a piece from it with his knife. "'Father,' said he, "'I am now certain that this bed of rocks, over which we are walking, and which we fancied was formed of stone or flints, is nothing but the work of these remarkable zoophytes called coral insects, which form coral and many other extraordinary things. They can even make whole islands. Look at these little points and hollows, and these stars of every colour and every form. I would give all the world to have a specimen of each kind." He succeeded in breaking off a piece, which was of a deep orange colour inside. He collected also, and deposited in his bag, some other pieces of various forms and colours. These greatly enriched his collection, and, idle as he was, he did not complain of any difficulty in obtaining them. He had given his gun to Jack, who had complained much of the ruggedness of our road. Our march was truly painful, and I repented more than once of having yielded to the idea. Besides the misery of walking along these shelly rocks, 
which presented points like the sharp teeth of a saw, tearing our shoes and even our skin. The sea in some of the lower places was so high as to bar our passage, and we were obliged in the interval between two waves to rush across with the water to our chins. We had some difficulty to avoid being carried away. I trembled especially for Jack. Though small and light, he preferred facing the wave to avoiding it. I was several times obliged to catch hold of him, and narrowly escaped destruction along with him. Happily, our march was not above half a mile, and we gained the shore at last without any serious accident, but much fatigued and footsore, and we made a resolution never more to cross the coral reefs. The island was much narrower here, and instead of the wide plain crossed by a river, divided by delightful woods, giving an idea of paradise on earth, we were journeying through a contracted valley lying between the rocky wall which divided the island and a chain of sandy hills which hid the sea and sheltered the valley from the wind. Fritz and I ascended one of these hills. Any navigators sailing along these shores would pronounce the island inaccessible and entirely barren. This is not the fact. The grass is very thick, and the trees of noble growth. We found many unknown to us, some loaded with fruit. I should never finish if I were to try and name all the plants found in this shady valley, which might be called the botanic garden of nature. Ernest was in ecstasies. He wished to carry away everything, but he did not know how to dispose of them. Ah! said he, if only our grotto was open on this side! At this moment Fritz came running out of breath, crying out, The breadfruit tree! I have found the breadfruit tree! Here is the fruit! Excellent, delicious bread! Taste it, father! Here, Ernest, here, Jack! And he gave each of us a part of an oval fruit, about the size of an ordinary melon, which really seemed very good and nourishing. There are many of these trees, continued he, loaded with fruit. Would that we had our grotto opened! that we might collect a store of them now that they are ripe. My boys pointed out to me exactly the situation of the grotto, judging from the rock above, and longed for their tools that they might commence the opening directly. We proceeded to make our way through a border of trees and bushes that separated us from the rock, that we might examine it and judge of the difficulties of our undertaking. Jack preceded us, as usual, after giving Ernest his gun, Fritz followed him, and suddenly turning to me said, I believe kind nature has saved us much trouble. The rock appears to be divided from top to bottom. At the foot I see a sort of cave or grotto already made. Chapter 45 It was a gentle stream, gushing from a perpendicular rock. Then forming a graceful bend, it took its course towards the great bay and fell in a cascade into the sea. We remained some time here to fill our gourds, drinking moderately, and taking a bath, which refreshed us all greatly. The evening was approaching, and we began to fear we should not reach home before night. I had warned my wife that there was a possibility that we might be delayed, though I could not then anticipate the cause of our delay. We endeavoured, however, by walking as quickly as we could, and resting no more, to reach our farm at any rate. We followed the course of the river, on the opposite shore of which rose a wide plain, where we saw the herd of buffaloes quietly grazing, ruminating, and drinking, without paying the slightest attention to us. We thought we distinguished some other quadrupeds amongst them, which Fritz was certain were zebras or anagras, but certainly not his dear gazelle, for which he had incessantly looked round. Jack was in despair that the river separated us from the buffaloes, so that he could not cast his lasso round the legs of one of them, as he had promised Ernest. He even wished to swim across the stream to have a hunt, but I forbade him, encouraging him to hope that perhaps a single buffalo might cross to our side, and throw itself in the way of his lasso. I was far from wishing such a thing myself for we had no time to lose, nor any means to secure and lead it home, should we succeed in capturing one, not having any cords with us. 
and moreover intending to return from the bay in the canoe. When we arrived at the bay, the night which comes on rapidly in equinoctial countries had almost closed. We were scarcely able to see, without terror, the changes that the late storm had occasioned. The narrow pass which led from the other side of the island, between the river and a deep stream that flowed from the rocks, was entirely obstructed with rocks and earth fallen upon it, and to render our passage practicable, it was necessary to undertake a labour that the darkness now prevented, and which would at any time be attended by danger. We were obliged then to spend the night in the open air, and separated from our dear and anxious friends at Tent House. Fortunately, Fritz had collected a store of breadfruit for his mother, with which he had filled his own pockets and those of his brothers. These, with water from the river, formed our supper, for we had nothing but the bone of our leg of mutton left. We turned back a little way, to establish ourselves under a clump of trees, where we were in greater safety. We loaded our muskets, we kindled a large fire of dry branches, and recommending ourselves to the protection of God, we lay ourselves down on the soft moss to wait for the first rays of light. With the exception of Jack, who from the first slept as if he had been in his bed, we none of us could rest. The night was beautiful. A multitude of stars shone over our heads in the ethereal vault. Ernest was never tired of gazing on them. After some questions and suppositions on the plurality of worlds, their courses and their distances, he quitted us to wander on the borders of the river, which reflected them in all their brilliancy. From this night his passion for astronomy commenced, a passion which he carried beyond all others. This became his favourite and continual study, nor did he fall far short of Duval, whose history he had read. Whilst he was engaged in contemplation, Fritz and I conversed on our projects for tunnelling to the grotto, and on the utility of such a passage, as this side of the island was quite lost to us from the difficulty in reaching it. "'And yet,' said I, "'it is to this difficulty we owe the safety we have enjoyed. Who can say that the bears and the buffaloes may not find the way through the grotto?' I confess I am not desirous of their visits, nor even of those of the Onagras. Who knows but they might persuade your favourite Lightfoot to return and live amongst them? Liberty has many charms. Till now we have been very happy on our side of the island, without the productions of this. My dear boy, there is a proverb, let well enough alone. Let us not have too much ambition, it has ruined greater states than ours. For it seemed grieved to give up his plan, and suggested that he could forge some strong bars of iron to place before the opening, which could be removed at will. But, said I, they will not prevent the snakes from passing underneath. I have noticed some with terror, as they are animals I have a great antipathy to, and if your mother saw one crawl into her grotto, she would never enter it again, even if she did not die of fright. Well, we must give it up, said Fritz, but it is a pity. Do you think, father, that there are more bears in the island than those we killed? In all probability, said I. It is scarcely to be supposed that there should be only two. I cannot well account for their being here. They can swim very well, and perhaps the abundance of fruit in this part of the island may have attracted them. I then gave my son a short account of their manners and habits from the best works on the history of these animals. CHAPTER 46 Whilst we continued to talk, and to admire the beauty of the stars, they at length began to fade away before the first light of morning. Ernest returned to us, and we awoke Jack, who had slept uninterruptedly, and was quite unconscious where he was. We returned to the pass, which now, by the light of day, seemed to us in a more hopeless state than in the dusk of evening. I was struck with consternation. It appeared to me that we were entirely enclosed at this side, and I shuddered to think of crossing the island again, to 
pass round at the other end, of the risk we should run of meeting wild beasts, and of the painful and perilous passage along the coral reefs. At that moment I would gladly have consented to open a passage through the grotto, at the hazard of any visitors, in order to get through myself that I might relieve the anxious feelings of my dear wife and boy. The thoughts of their agony unnerved me, and took away all courage for the commencement of a labour which seemed impossible, our only utensils being a small saw, and a little dibble for taking up plants which Ernest had been unwilling to leave behind us. The path by which Jack and I had passed was covered with rocks and masses of soil, which obstructed even the course of the stream. We could not discover the place we had forded. The river had opened itself a wider course, far beyond its former one. "'It is impossible,' said Fritz, gazing on the ruins, "'that we can remove all those immense stones without proper tools. Hmm, but perhaps with a little courage we may cross over them. The rivulet being widened cannot be very deep. At all events it cannot be worse than the coral reefs.' "'Let us try. But I fear it will be impossible, at least for him.' said I, pointing to Jack. "'Him, indeed, papa, and why not?' said the bold fellow. "'He is perhaps as strong and more active than some of them. Ask Fritz what he thinks of his workmen. Shall I go the first to show you the way?' And he was advancing boldly, but I checked him, and said, that before we undertook to scale these masses of rock absolutely bare, where we had nothing to support us or to hold by, it would be as well to examine if, by descending lower, we could not find a less dangerous road. We descended to the narrow pass, and found our drawbridge, plantation, all our fortification that my boys were so proud of, and where, at Fritz's request, I had even planted a small cannon, all, all destroyed. The cannon swallowed up with the rest. My boys deplored their disappointment, but I showed them how useless such a defence must ever be. Nature had provided us with a better fortification than we could construct, as we had just now bitterly experienced. We had descended several yards lower with incredible difficulty, plunged in a wet heavy soil, and obliged to step across immense stones, when Fritz, who went first, cried out joyfully, "'The roof, papa! The roof of our chalet!' It is quite whole. It will be a bridge for us if we can only get to it." "'What roof? What chalet?' said I, in astonishment. "'The roof of our little hermitage,' said he, which we had covered so well with stones like the Swiss chalets. I then recollected that I had made this little hut, after the fashion of the Swiss chalet, of bark, with a roof nearly flat and covered with stones, to secure it against the winds. It was this circumstance and its situation that had saved it in the storm. I had placed it opposite the cascade, that we might see the fall in all its beauty, and consequently a little on one side of the passage filled up by the fall of the rocks. Some fragments reached the roof of the hut, and we certainly could not have entered it, but the chalet was supported by this means, and the roof was still standing and perfectly secure. We contrived to slide along the rock which sustained it. Jack was the first to stand on the roof and sing victory. It was very easy to descend on the other side, holding by the poles and pieces of bark, and we soon found ourselves safe in our own island. Ernest had lost his gun in the passage. Not being willing to resign his bag of curiosities, he had dropped the gun into the abyss. "'You may take the gun I left in the canoe,' said Fritz but another time throw away your stones and keep your gun. You will find it a good friend in need." "'Let us embark in our canoe,' cried Jack. "'The sea! The sea! Long live the waves! They are not as hard as the stones.' I was very glad to have the opportunity of conveying my canoe back to the port of Tent House. Our important occupations had prevented me till now, and everything favoured the plan. The sea was calm the wind favourable, and we should arrive at home sooner and with less fatigue than by land. We skirted the great bay to the cabbage-palm wood. 
I had moored the canoe so firmly to one of the palms that I felt secure of it being there. We arrived at the place, and no canoe was there. The mark of the cord which fastened it was still to be seen round the tree, but the canoe had entirely disappeared. Struck with astonishment, we looked at each other with terror, and without being able to articulate a word. What was become of it? Some animal. The jackals? A monkey, perhaps, might have detached it, said Jack. But they could not have eaten the canoe, and we could not find a trace of it, any more than of the gun Fritz had left in it. This extraordinary circumstance gave me a great deal of thought. Savages surely had landed on our island and carried off our canoe. We could no longer doubt it when we discovered on the sands the print of naked feet. It is easy to believe how uneasy and agitated I was. I hastened to take the road to Tent House, from which we were now more than three leagues distant. I forbade my sons to mention this event, or our suspicions, to their mother, as I knew it would rob her of all peace of mind. I tried to console myself. It was possible that chance had conducted them to the bay, that they had seen our pretty canoe, and that, satisfied with their prize, and seeing no inhabitants, they might not return. Perhaps, on the contrary, these islanders might prove kind and humane, and become our friends. There was no trace of their proceedings further than the shore. We called at the farm on purpose to examine. All appeared in order, and certainly, if they had reached here, there was much to tempt them our cotton mattresses, our osier seats, and some household utensils that my wife had left here. Our geese and fowls did not appear to have been alarmed, but were pecking about as usual for worms and insects. I began to hope that we might get off with the loss of our canoe, a loss which might be repaired. We were a sufficient number, being well armed, not to be afraid of a few savages, even if they penetrated further into the island and showed hostile intentions. I exhorted my sons to do nothing to irritate them, on the contrary, to meet them with kindness and attention, and to commit no violence against them unless called on to defend their lives. I also recommended them to select from the wrecked chest some articles likely to please the savages, and to carry them always about with them. And I beseech you once more, added I, not to alarm your mother. They promised me, and we continued our road unmolested to Falcon's Nest. Jack preceded us, delighted, he said, to see our castle again, which he hoped the savages had not carried away. Suddenly we saw him return, running, with terror painted on his countenance. They are there, said he. They have taken possession of it. Our dwelling is full of them. Oh, how frightful they are! What a blessing Mama is not there! She would have died of fright to see them enter. I confess I was much agitated, but, not wishing to expose my children to danger before I had done all in my power to prevent it, I ordered them to remain behind till I called them. I broke a branch from a tree hastily, which I held in one hand, and in the other some long nails, which I found by chance in the bottom of my pocket and I advanced thus to my tree-castle. I expected to have found the door of my staircase torn open and broken, and our new guest ascending and descending, but I saw at once it was closed as I had left it. Being of bark it was not easily distinguished. How had these savages reached the dwelling forty feet from the ground? I had placed planks before the great opening. They were no longer there. The greater part of them had been hurled down to the ground, and I heard such a noise in our house that I could not doubt Jack's report. I advanced timidly, holding up in the air the branch and my offerings, when I discovered, all at once, that I was offering them to a troop of monkeys, lodged in the fortress, which they were amusing themselves by destroying. We had numbers of them in the island some large and mischievous, against whom we had had some difficulty in defending ourselves when crossing the woods where they principally dwelt. 
the frequent report of firearms round our dwelling had kept them aloof till now, when, emboldened by our absence, and enticed by the figs on our tree, they had come in crowds. These vexatious animals had got through the roof, and once in had thrown down the planks that covered the opening. They made the most frightful grimaces, throwing down everything they could seize. Although this devastation caused me much vexation, I could not help laughing at their antics, and at the humble and submissive manner in which I had advanced to pay homage to them. I called my sons, who laughed heartily, and rallied the prince of the monkeys without mercy, for not knowing his own subjects. Fritz wished much to discharge his gun amongst them, but I forbade him. I was too anxious to reach Tent House, to be able to turn my thoughts on these depredators just now. We continued our journey, but I pause here. My heart is oppressed. My feelings when I reached home require another chapter to describe them, and I must summon courage for the task. Chapter 47 We soon arrived at Family Bridge, where I had some hopes of meeting Francis, and perhaps his mother, who was beginning to walk very well but I was disappointed, they were not there. Yet I was not uneasy, for they were neither certain of the hour of our return, nor of the way we might take. I expected, however, to find them in the colonnade. They were not there. I hastily entered the house. I called aloud, Elizabeth! Francis! Where are you? No one answered. A mortal terror seized me, and for a moment I could not move. They will be in the grotto, said Ernest. Or in the garden, said Fritz. Perhaps on the shore, cried Jack. My mother likes to watch the waves, and Francis may be gathering shells. These were possibilities. My sons flew in all directions to search of their mother and brother. I found it impossible to move, and was obliged to sit down. I trembled, and my heart beat till I could scarcely breathe. I did not venture to dwell on the extent of my fears, or rather, I had no distinct notion of them. I tried to recover myself. I murmured, Yes, at the grotto or the garden. They will return directly. Still I could not compose myself. I was overwhelmed with a sad presentiment of the misfortune which impended over me. It was but too soon realized. My sons returned in fear and consternation. They had no occasion to tell me the result of their search. I saw it at once, and sinking down motionless, I cried, Alas! They are not there! Jack returned the last, and in the most frightful state. He had been at the seashore, and throwing himself into my arms, he sobbed out, The savages have been here, and carried away my mother and Francis. Perhaps they have devoured them. I have seen the marks of their horrible feet on the sands and the print of dear Francis's boots. This account at once recalled me to strength and action. Come, my children, let us fly to save them. God will pity our sorrow and assist us. He will restore them. Come, come! They were ready in a moment. But a distracting thought seized me. Had they carried off the pinnace? If so, every hope was gone. Jack, in his distress, had never thought of remarking this, but the instant I named it, Fritz and he ran to ascertain the important circumstance, Ernest, in the meantime, supporting me and endeavouring to calm me. Perhaps, said he, they are still in the island. Perhaps they may have fled to hide themselves in some wood or amongst the reeds. Even if the pinnace be left, it would be prudent to search the island from end to end before we leave it. Trust Fritz and me, we will do this, and even if we find them in the hands of the enemy, we will recover them. Whilst we are off on this expedition, you can be preparing for our voyage, and we will search the world from one end to the other, every country and every sea, but we will find them, and we shall succeed. Let us put our whole trust in God. He is our Father. He will not try us beyond our strength. I embraced my child, and a flood of tears relieved my overcharged heart. My eyes and hands were raised to heaven, 
my silent prayers winged their flight to the Almighty, to him who tries us and consoles us. A ray of hope seemed to visit my mind, when I heard my boys cry out as they approached, The pinnace is here! They have not carried that away! I fervently thanked God. It was a kind of miracle, for this pretty vessel was more tempting than the canoe. Perhaps, as it was hidden in a little creek between the rocks, it had escaped their observation. Perhaps they might not know how to manage it, or they might not be numerous enough. No matter, it was there, and might be the means of our recovering the beloved objects these barbarians had torn from us. How gracious is God to give us hope to sustain us in our afflictions! Without hope we could not live. It restores and revives us, and even if never realized below, accompanies us to the end of our life and beyond the grave. I imparted to my eldest son the idea of his brother, that they might be concealed in some part of the island, but I dared not rely on this sweet hope. Finally, as we ought not to run the risk of abandoning them, if they were still here, and perhaps in the power of the savages, I consented that my two eldest sons should go to ascertain the fact. Besides, however impatient I was, I felt that a voyage such as we were undertaking into unknown seas might be of long duration, and it was necessary to make some preparations. I must think on food, water, arms, and many other things. There are situations in life which seize the heart and soul, rendering us insensible to the wants of the body. This we now experienced. We had just come from a painful journey, on foot, of twenty-four hours, during which we had had little rest and no sleep. Since morning we had eaten nothing but some morsels of the breadfruit. It was natural that we should be overcome with fatigue and hunger. But we none of us had even thought of our own state. We were supported, if I may use the expression, by our despair. At the moment that my sons were going to set out. The remembrance of their need of refreshment suddenly occurred to me, and I besought them to rest a little and take something, but they were too much agitated to consent. I gave Fritz a bottle of canary, and some slices of roast mutton I met with, which he put in his pocket. They had each a loaded musket, and they set out, taking the road along the rocks, where the most hidden retreats and most impenetrable woods lay. They promised me to fire off their pieces frequently to let their mother know that they were there, if she was hidden among the rocks. They took also one of the dogs. Flora we could not find, which made us conclude she had followed her mistress, to whom she was much attached. As soon as my eldest sons had left us, I made Jack conduct me to the shore where he had seen the footmarks, that I might examine them to judge of their number and direction. I found many very distinct, but so mingled I could come to no positive conclusion. Some were near the sea, with the foot pointing to the shore, and amongst these Jack thought he could distinguish the boot-mark of Francis. My wife wore very light boots also, which I had made for her. They rendered stockings unnecessary, and strengthened her ankles. I could not find the trace of these, but I soon discovered that my poor Elizabeth had been here, from a piece torn from an apron she wore, made of her own cotton, and dyed red. I had now not the least doubt that she was in the canoe with her son. It was a sort of consolation to think they were together, but how many mortal fears accompanied this consolation! Oh, was I ever to see again these objects of my tenderest affection! certain now that they were not in the island. I was impatient for the return of my sons, and I made every preparation for our departure. The first thing I thought of was the wrecked chest, which would furnish me with means to conciliate the savages, and to ransom my loved ones. I added to it everything likely to tempt them, utensils, stuffs, trinkets. I even took with me gold and silver coin, which was thrown on one side as useless, but might be of service to us on this occasion. I wished my riches were three times as much as they were, 
than I might give all in exchange for the life and liberty of my wife and son. I then turned my thoughts on those remaining to me. I took, in bags and gourds, all that we had left of cassava bread, manioc roots, and potatoes, a barrel of salt fish, two bottles of rum, and several jars of fresh water. Jack wept as he filled them at his fountain, which he perhaps might never see again, any more than his dear Valiant, whom I set at liberty, as well as the cow, ass, buffalo, and the beautiful Onagra. These docile animals were accustomed to us and our attentions, and they remained in their places, surprised that they were neither harnessed nor mounted. We opened the poultry-yard and pigeon-coat. The flamingo would not leave us. It went and came with us from the house to the pinnace. We took also oil, candles, fuel, and a large iron pot to cook our provisions in. For our defence I took two more guns, and a small barrel of powder, all we had left. I added besides some changes of linen, not forgetting some for my dear wife, which I hoped might be needed. The time fled rapidly while we were thus employed. Night came on and my sons returned not. My grief was inconceivable. The island was so large and woody that they might have lost themselves, or that savages might have returned and encountered them. After twenty hours of frightful terror, I heard the report of a gun. Alas, only one report! It was the signal agreed on if they returned alone, two if they brought their mother, three if Francis also accompanied them. But I expected they would return alone, and I was still grateful. I ran to meet them. They were overcome with fatigue and vexation. They begged to set out immediately, not to lose one precious moment. They were now sure the island did not contain those they lamented, and they hoped I would not return without discovering them, for what would the island be to us without our loved ones? Fritz, at that moment, saw his dear Lightfoot capering round him, and could not help sighing as he caressed him, and took leave of him. "'May I find thee here,' said he, "'where I leave thee in such sorrow, and I will bring back thy young master,' added he, turning to the bull who was also approaching him. He then begged me again to set out, as the moon was just rising in all her majesty. "'The Queen of Night,' said Ernest will guide us to the queen of our island, who is perhaps now looking up to her and calling on us to help her. Most assuredly, said I, she is thinking on us. But it is on God she is calling for help. Let us join her in prayer, my dear children, for herself and our dear Francis. They fell on their knees with me, and I uttered the most fervent and earnest prayer that ever human heart poured forth and I rose with confidence that our prayers were heard. I proceeded with new courage to the creek that contained our pinnace, where Jack arranged all we had brought. We rowed out of the creek, and when we were in the bay, we held a council to consider on which side we were to commence our search. I thought of returning to the great bay, from whence our canoe had been taken. My sons, on the contrary, thought that these islanders, content with their acquisition, had been returning homewards, coasting along the island, when an unhappy chance had led their mother and brother to the shore, where the savages had seen them and carried them off. At the most they could be but a day before us, but that was long enough to fill us with dreadful anticipations. I yielded to the opinion of my sons, which had a great deal of reason on its side. Besides, the wind was favourable in that direction and abandoning ourselves in full confidence to Almighty God, we spread our sails, and were soon in the open sea. End of chapter Chapter 48 A gentle wind swelled our sails, and the current carried us rapidly into the open sea. I then seated myself at the helm and employed the little knowledge I had gained during our voyage from Europe in directing our bark, so that we might avoid the rocks and coral banks that surrounded our island. My two oldest sons, overcome with fatigue, had no sooner seated themselves on a bench 
than they fell into a profound sleep, notwithstanding their sorrows. Jack held out the best. His love of the sea kept him awake, and I surrendered the helm to him till I took a momentary slumber, my head resting against the stern. A happy dream placed me in the midst of my family in our dear island, but a shout from Ernest woke me. He was calling on Jack to leave the helm, as he was contriving to run the vessel among the breakers on the coast. I seized the helm, and soon set all right, determined not to trust my giddy son again. Jack, of all my sons, was the one who evinced most taste for the sea, but being so young when we made our voyage, his knowledge of nautical affairs was very scanty. My elder sons had learnt more. Ernest, who had a great thirst for knowledge of every kind, had questioned the pilot on all he had seen him do. He had learned a great deal in theory, but of practical knowledge he had none. The mechanical genius of Fritz had drawn conclusions from what he saw. This would have induced me to place much trust in him, in case of that danger which I prayed heaven might be averted. What a situation was mine for a father! Wandering through unknown and dangerous seas with my three sons, my only hope, in search of a fourth and of my beloved helpmate, utterly ignorant which way we should direct our course, or where to find a trace of those we sought. How often do we allay the happiness granted us below by vain wishes! I had at one time regretted that we had no means of leaving our island. Now we had left it, and our sole wish was to recover those we had lost, to bring them back to it, and never to leave it more. I sometimes regretted that I had led my sons into this danger. I might have ventured alone, but I reflected that I could not have left them, for Fritz had said, if the savages had carried off the pinnace, I would have swum from isle to isle till I had found them. My boys all endeavoured to encourage and console me. Fritz placed himself at the rudder, observing that the pinnace was new and well built, and likely to resist a tempest. Ernest stood on the deck silently watching the stars, only breaking his silence by telling me he should be able by them to supply the want of the compass, and point out how we should direct our course. Jack climbed dexterously up the mast to let me see his skill. We called him the cabin boy. Fritz was the pilot, Ernest the astronomer, and I was the captain and commander of the expedition. Daybreak showed us we had passed far from our island, which now only appeared a dark speck. I, as well as Fritz and Jack, was of the opinion that it would be advisable to go round it, and try our fortune on the opposite coast. But Ernest, who had not forgotten his telescope, was certain he saw land in a direction he pointed out to us. We took the glass, and were soon convinced he was right. As day advanced, we saw the land plainly, and did not hesitate to sail towards it. As this appeared the land nearest to our island, we supposed the savages might have conveyed their captives there. But more trials awaited us before we arrived there. It being necessary to shift the sail, in order to reach the coast in view, my poor cabin-boy Jack ran up the mast, holding by the ropes. But before he reached the sail, the rope which he held broke suddenly. He was precipitated into the sea, and disappeared in a moment but he soon rose to the surface trying to swim and mingling his cries with ours. Fritz, who was the first to see the accident, was in the water almost as soon as Jack, and seizing him by the hair, swam with the other hand, calling on him to try and keep afloat and hold by him. When I saw my two sons thus struggling with the waves, that were very strong from a land wind, I should in my despair have leaped in after them but Ernest held me, and implored me to remain to assist in getting them into the pinnace. He had thrown ropes to them, and a bench which he had torn up with the strength of despair. Fritz had contrived to catch one of the ropes, and fasten it round Jack, who still swam but feebly, as if nearly exhausted. Fritz had been considered an excellent swimmer in Switzerland. He preserved all his presence of mind, calling to us to draw the rope gently while he supported the poor boy and pushed him towards the pinnace. At last I was able to reach and draw him up, and when I saw him extended nearly lifeless at the bottom of the pinnace, 
I fell down senseless beside him. How precious to us now was the composed mind of Ernest! In the midst of such a scene he was calm and collected. Promptly disengaging the rope from the body of Jack, he flung it back to Fritz, to help him in reaching the pinnace, attaching the other end firmly to the mast. This done, quicker than I can write it, he approached us, raised his brother so that he might relieve himself from the quantity of water he had swallowed, then turning to me, restored me to my senses by administering to me some drops of rum, and by saying, Courage, father, you have saved Jack, and I will save Fritz. He is hold of the rope, he is swimming strongly, he is coming, he is here. He left me to assist his brother, who was soon in the vessel and in my arms. Jack, perfectly recovered, joined him, and fervently did I thank God for granting me, in the midst of my trials, such a moment of happiness. We could not help fancying this happy preservation was an augury of our success in our anxious search, and that we should bring back the lost ones to our island. "'Oh, how terrified Mamma would have been,' said Jack, "'to see me sink. I thought I was going, like a stone, to the bottom of the sea, but I pushed out my arms and legs with all my strength, and up I rose." He, as well as Fritz, was quite wet. I had by chance brought some changes of clothes, which I made them put on, after giving each a little rum. They were so much fatigued, and I was so overcome by my agitation, that we were obliged to relinquish rowing most unwillingly as the skies threatened a storm. We gradually began to distinguish clearly the island we wished to approach, and the land-birds, which came to rest on our sails, gave us hopes that we should reach it before night. But suddenly such a thick fog arose, that it hid every object from us, even the sea itself, and we seemed to be sailing among the clouds. I thought it prudent to drop our anchor, as fortunately we had a tolerably strong one, but there appeared so little water that I feared we were near the breakers, and I watched anxiously for the fog to dissipate and permit us to see the coast. It finally changed into a heavy rain, which we could with difficulty protect ourselves from. There was, however, a half-deck to the pinnace under which we crept, and sheltered ourselves. Here, crowded close together, we talked over the late accident. Fritz assured me he was never in any danger, and that he would plunge again into the sea that moment, if he had the least hope that it would lead him to find his mother and Francis. We all said the same, though Jack confessed that his friends, the waves, had not received his visit very politely, but had even beat him very rudely. "'But I would bear twice as much,' said he, "'to see Mamma and dear Francis again. Do you think, Papa, that the savages could ever hurt them?' Mamma is so good, and Francis is so pretty, and then poor Mamma is so lame yet. I hope they would pity her and carry her. Alas! I could not hope as my boy did. I feared that they would force her to walk. I tried to conceal other horrible fears that almost threw me into despair. I recalled all the cruelties of the cannibal nations, and shuddered to think that my Elizabeth and my darling child were perhaps in their ferocious hands. Prayer and confidence in God were the only means, not to console but to support me, and teach me to endure my heavy affliction with resignation. I looked on my three sons, and endeavoured for their sakes to hope and submit. The darkness rapidly increased, till it became total. We concluded it was night. The rain having ceased, I went out to strike a light, as I wished to hang the lighted lantern to the mast, when Ernest, who was on deck, called out loudly, "'Father! Brothers! Come! The sea is on fire!' And indeed, as far as the eye could reach, the surface of the water appeared in flames. This light, of the most brilliant fiery red, reached even to the vessel, and we were surrounded by it. It was a sight at once beautiful and almost terrific. Jack seriously inquired if there was not a volcano at the bottom of the sea, and I astonished him much by telling him that this light was caused by a kind of marine animal, which in form resembled plants so much that they were formerly considered such. 
but naturalists and modern voyagers have entirely destroyed this error and furnished proofs that they are organized beings having all the spontaneous movements peculiar to animals they feel when they are touched seek for food seize and devour it they are of various kinds and colors and are known under the general name of zoophytes and this which glitters in such beautiful colors on the sea is called pyrosoma said ernest see here are some i've caught in my hat you may see them move how they change color orange green blue like the rainbow and when you touch them the flame appears still more brilliant now they are pale yellow they amused themselves some time with these bright and beautiful creatures which appeared to have but a half-life they occupied a large space on the water and their astonishing radiance in the midst of the darkness of the atmosphere had such a striking and magnificent effect that for a few moments we were diverted from our own sad thoughts but an observation from jack soon recalled them if francis passed this way said he how he would be amused by these funny creatures which look like fire but do not burn but i know he would be afraid to touch them and how much afraid mamma would be as she likes no animals she does not know ah how glad i shall be to tell her all about our voyage and my excursion into the sea and how fritz dragged me by the hair and what they call these fiery fishes tell me again ernest a pi 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 pyrosoma mr perone calls them said ernest the description of them is very interesting in his voyage which i have read to mamma and as she would recollect it she would not be afraid i pray to god replied i that she may have nothing more to fear than the pyrosoma and that we may soon see them again with her and francis we all said amen and the day breaking we decided to weigh the anchor and endeavor to find a passage through the reefs to reach the island which we now distinctly saw and which seemed an uncultivated and rocky coast i resumed my place at the helm my sons took the oars and we advanced cautiously sounding every minute what would have become of us if our pinnace had been injured the sea was perfectly calm and after prayer to god and a slight refreshment we proceeded forward looking carefully round for any canoe of the savages it might be even our own but no we were not fortunate enough to discover any trace of our beloved friends nor any symptom of the isle being inhabited however as it was our only point of hope we did not wish to abandon it by dint of searching we found a small bay which reminded us of our own it was formed by a river broad and deep enough for our pinnace to enter we rowed in and having placed our vessel in a creek where it appeared to be secure we began to consider the means of exploring the whole island 